there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. Our show is about the troubled state of diplomacy in the Trump era. Churchill famously said, jaw, jaw is always better than war, war. And General Jim Mattis, when he was Secretary of Defense, stated that cutting funding for diplomacy would require him to buy more ammunition. But our foreign service has been sadly degraded lately, as we see the State Department demoralized by budget cuts, resignations, and unprincipled attacks coming from the White House and the Congress. Veteran Foreign Service officers say morale was never lower. With us is William Burns, a consummate diplomat who will help us assess the damage. His service spanned over 30 years under five Republican and Democratic presidents and 10 secretaries of state. Bill Burns was our ambassador to Russia, as well as Jordan. The capstone to his illustrious career was more than three years he served as deputy secretary of state, the number two job in the State Department. He's written a fascinating book about his life in statecraft, entitled The Back Channel, a memoir of American diplomacy and the case for its renewal, a must read for any interested citizen. Bill Burns, thank you for your service. We're honored to have you join the conversation. It's great to be with you, Jim. Now, Bill, um, first, what drew you to the Foreign Service? You uh, entered in uh, 1982? Beginning in 1982. I wish I could tell you that I had a sort of 20 you know, year plan before me when I, when I took the exam uh, to enter the U.S. Foreign Service. But my dad had been a career military officer, so I always had huge respect for public service through his eyes in the military. And then when I was 18, I spent four months in Egypt uh, living with my best friend in high school and his father, who was then the U.S. ambassador to Egypt. And that was kind of my introduction to diplomacy and embassies. And I got hooked. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to pass the exam a few years later and never expected to remain in the Foreign Service for 35 years. But it was a very fortunate professional life. Now, in uh, 1982, Ronald Reagan was the president. Did that figure at all in, in your decision? No, not really. I mean, you know, I serve proudly for administrations of both parties, just as you mentioned earlier. Um, this was the height of the Cold War, so my worldview initially was very much shaped by U.S.-Soviet competition and the Cold War. Now, your book is about diplomacy, and uh, it's almost a love letter to diplomacy, acknowledging uh, it's perhaps its shortcomings and mm -hmm. also extolling its virtues. Uh, first, can you give us what is your definition of diplomacy? Well, I think diplomacy is what uh, governments and societies use. It's a tool to promote their interests overseas by means short of the use of force, simply because given the cost in blood and treasure of the use of the military or the, or the American military, it pays, I think, to do everything you can um, to promote your interests short of the use of force. And that's really what diplomacy is all about. It means harnessing all the different levers of American power, from our economic leverage, our military leverage, to try to produce good outcomes for the American people. Well, could you contrast for us perhaps uh, diplomacy and military action? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, military action ought to be our tool of last resort. I'm enormously proud of the capability of the U.S. military. There's no military in the world that can compete with us. But it really ought to be our tool of last resort. Diplomacy ought to be our tool of first resort. What you, what you make use of in order to promote our interests, sometimes diplomacy isn't going to produce those outcomes. Sometimes the use of force becomes, you know, um, something that we have to resort to. But we ought to do everything we can to avoid that. Well, we always fond of saying, I guess, uh, parroting or channeling uh, John Marshall that we're a government of laws, not men and women. Um, but in diplomacy, who is the man in wherever or the woman in wherever matters, doesn't it? It does, because diplomacy really is a business of human interactions. For all the advances in technology and the way in which international society has become more connected, what still matters most um, is that connection between people. And that's what diplomats are trained to do, to understand what comes first, which is the interests and the values of their own society, of American society, but understand foreign landscapes so that you can promote those interests and values effectively. Now, what elements, in your view, go into uh, becoming a, uh, a skilled diplomat? 
Well, I mean, some of the elements haven't changed much over time. It's an understanding of history, of other cultures, of foreign languages, the tools that enable you to navigate those societies effectively. But increasingly in the modern age, in the world of the technology revolution, you know, you also have to understand the ways in which social media and technology have revolutionized communication. You have to understand 21st century challenges like climate change, for example, in the same way that, you know, a generation or two before mine in the American diplomatic service had to understand arms control and the phenomenon of nuclear weapons as well. They're still important, but in addition to that, we have that huge existential crisis of climate change as well. Uh, and the virtues that go into a, a good diplomat? Oh, I, I think, think in your book you said there are a trinity of virtues. Yeah, in some ways it's, it's judgment, good judgment, and ability to understand how best to navigate those foreign landscapes, and understanding of your own societies as well. Um, because oftentimes diplomats who spend long periods of service overseas can lose track of their own societies, and that's absolutely essential. You have to know where you're coming from in order to get any place overseas as well. A sense of balance. I think a sense of empathy, which is different than sympathy for other governments or other societies. Empathy in the sense of understanding what animates them, because you know that doesn't mean that you have to accept their perspectives, let alone indulge them. But understanding them is the starting point, I think, for effectively promoting American interests. Now, what about uh, personal diplomacy at the summit? Um, Trump came back from Singapore saying he was in love with Kim Jong-un after trashing him in the UN and, uh, and outside the UN. Uh, does uh, any of this posturing make any difference? Or is it yeah, it does. I mean, as I said, diplomacy is a business of human interactions, and so relationships between leaders are enormously important. It's this, uh, you can't get infatuated with those relationships. I think you have to be able to prepare well for those encounters. So, for example, with President Trump's encounters with Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, I never took issue with the value of trying to engage even the most adversarial leaders overseas, but the ground has to be well prepared and that's what professional diplomacy is about too. You've gotta to be a re realistic because you know, diplomacy and promoting your country's interests is not just about getting along with foreign leaders, it's about moving your interests along. Well, I mean, is it diplomatic malpractice just to wing it, uh, go there, shake hands, raise a glass, uh uh, pat someone on the shoulder and it, go it, off and say you're in love? Yeah, if that's all it is, it is a form of diplomatic malpractice. It's, it's diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism as opposed to the diplomacy I learned a long time ago as a young diplomat working for President George H.W. Bush and Secretary of State Jim Baker. Uh, now, I've always been perplexed by something and that is uh, the relationship or uh, perhaps the detention, or the tension between the National Security Council and the State Department. Mm. And you write about that. Um, and uh, when you joined the Foreign Service, or perhaps later on uh, when Colin Powell mm. was uh, the uh, uh, National Security Advisor, the uh, White House staff, the National Security Council, was uh, much smaller than it is now. It's become swollen. Yeah, it was uh, what about, do you make of all that? Yeah, in the, in the second uh, term of the Reagan administration, I worked at the NSC staff for Colin Powell when he was the National Security Advisor to President Reagan. And the professional staff size then was about 60 people, some political appointees, some drawn from different agencies of the government. By the end of the Obama administration, the professional staff at the NSC had swollen to something like 300 staff members. Now some of that was understandable in the post 9-11 world, coordinating everything from counterterrorism policy to global economic policy required the NSC staff and the White House to play more of a role in coordinating all the different agencies that get involved in national security. Um, but I think it had gotten out of hand. The size of the staff meant that you know, people were tempted not just to focus on coordination of policy, but actually on 
centralizing and sometimes micromanaging policy as well, which tends to beat out a sense of initiative in some other agencies, including the State Department as well. Or being operational, which... Being operational as well, which can, you know, breed some bad habits too. So there's, there's a balance that needs to be struck. So did all that make for a, uh, a decline in the effectiveness of diplomacy? I think in some ways it did. We got in our own way. And I would be the first to add that the State Department sometimes was you know, guilty of being a little bit passive aggressive on these issues too. Individual diplomats, in my experience, can be capable of being incredibly resourceful and innovative and courageous. As an institution, the State Department is rarely accused of being too agile or too full of initiative. So when I talk about balance, I mean, the State Department has to step, step up as well. Um, and be willing to take more initiative, take more risk in terms of policy choices that it promotes to the White House and the way in which it carries out decisions that get made by the president. And that's the best way in some ways to create a situation in which the NSC staff is going to focus more on coordination of policy. Uh, now, you recently uh, wrote a piece in The Atlantic mm -hmm. entitled Impunity is Triumphing, triumphing Over Integrity. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit about Sure. That? I mean, I think there are tangible and intangible ways in which you can measure, I think, some of the corrosion, the hollowing out of the State Department as an institution. The tangible ways are pretty obvious. I mean, it's the sidelining of career expertise. Today, of the 28 assistant secretaries of state, these are the senior jobs around which the State Department organizes American foreign policy. Of those 28 jobs today, only one is held by a career officer confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Um, you have you know, a huge drop off in the number of young Americans applying to join the Foreign Service over the course of the last three years, the biggest drop off in several decades um, in the Foreign Service. You have a pernicious practice of going after individual career officers just because they worked on controversial issues in the last administration. And then you have the intangibles. You know, when President Trump was asked a couple years ago whether he was concerned about the record number of senior vacancies in the State Department, he said, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. That, again, is diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism. And then you have the behavior of the leadership of the State Department, of the Secretary of State, when, you know, his personnel, like Ambassador Yovanovitch in Ukraine, are unfairly accused by the White House, by Republicans in Congress and others, um, there's a failure to stand up for her and for other career professionals, none of whom sought the limelight or the public scrutiny that you know they walked into on Capitol Hill. They did their duties. They upheld their oaths to the Constitution, and they told the truth uh, to the Congress at considerable cost to their own, you know, professional lives um, as well as their own reputations too. So, you know, it, it's a shame in a way that it took that experience to help a lot of Americans who don't have much occasion to pay attention to professional diplomacy to see the quality and the integrity of, you know, the people that they support um, in American diplomacy and in the State Department. So, you know, that's what I meant about the danger before us of those examples of integrity in effect, being eroded over time by the impunity that all too often you see in this administration. I'd be the first to add, however, that you know the drift in American diplomacy is not something that was invented by Donald Trump. You know he's been the accelerator of a drift in you know support and budgetary resources for diplomacy that's gone on for some time. But if he wasn't the inventor of that, he's been the accelerator of it, in my view. Well, um, going back to the period of the Cold War, mm -hmm. which was uh, in existence when you joined the Foreign Service, and then later on you served as our ambassador to Russia from right. 2005 to 2008, have you seen an, uh, a change in our foreign policy and um, how, how has it evolved? Well, I mean, I think, you know, with the end of the Cold War, um, you had a moment for a quarter century or so after the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, early 1990s, in which by any objective measure, the United States is the singular dominant player on the international landscape. Today's landscape looks different. I, I would still argue that the United States still has a better hand to play. 
um, than any of our major rivals. But the truth is, you know, there's competition out there. We're no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block with the rise of China, the resurgence of Putin's Russia, the rise of India on a slower trajectory. And then you have these huge um, transformations politically, economically, technologically, environmentally as well that are beyond the capacity of any one state to deal with. Um, and you have increasing uncertainty, I think, amongst many Americans about what's the best role for disciplined American leadership in the world as well. So anybody sitting in the White House today would have a considerable task in trying to navigate all that and recognize that that disciplined leadership is still really important um, for Americans in promoting our prosperity and promoting our security overseas. But I worry about the drift that President Trump has accelerated, the dismissiveness toward the alliances and the coalitions of countries that actually matter more on that landscape I just described um, than they ever have before for the United States. We need company in some ways to amplify our influence in the world, and that's what diplomacy is all about. Company means allies. It means allies, it means partners, it means institutions that you know help us to shape rules, whether it's rules about the global trading system, whether it's rules about dealing with climate change or the proliferation of nuclear weapons or anything else. Well, I think you argue in your book that Trump asked the right question, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, things have changed since right. the uh, demise of the Soviet Union and the Cold War, and we need to uh, reshape our uh, foreign policy, reshape our alliances, have our allies contribute more, have uh, take on China, which is no longer a development country, but yep. it's an economic powerhouse, at least until uh, the uh, coronavirus may have sidetracked a little. But uh, he didn't answer those questions in an appropriate way. You, would you like to talk about that? I think that's right. I mean, I think that the questions that President Trump has asked, in some ways similar to what President Obama asked before him, are oftentimes the right questions. It's, it's how we go about trying to answer them to promote our, in, our own interests that's of concern to me. I think President Trump is right to push back against predatory Chinese trade and investment practices. But logically, you would think we'd want to make common cause with other countries who share those same concerns, whether it's Japan or the European Union. Instead, we start second and third front trade conflicts with them. President Trump, like President Obama before him, is right to push some of our NATO allies to spend more on defense. Um, that push has been overdue in some respects. But I think he's wrong to put into doubt the whole notion of whether those alliances matter to us. Because those alliances are going to have to shift and adapt to a much different international landscape. But that doesn't mean that they're any less important. It just means that they're going to have to be different, be a little bit different as well. So it's the right prescription in some ways, but, uh, or at least the right diagnosis, but the wrong prescription in my view. Well, he has uh, pursued a policy of withdrawal from uh, uh, foreign entanglements, much as uh, George Washington in his farewell address warned against foreign entanglements, which is just the opposite of globalization and, uh, and our foreign policy in the post-war era. Um, and uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, he's withdrawn from uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. He withdrew mm -hmm. from the Iran nuclear treaty. Uh, and uh, he certainly uh, weakened our allegiance to NATO, uh, Paris Peace Accords. It's just one after the other. Do you think this is the right approach? No, I don't. I mean, I think, as I, as I mentioned before, I think those alliances, partnerships, the international institutions and agreements that we've helped to shape are actually more important to us promoting our interests overseas and creating the space within which we can deal effectively with lots of problems in our own society today as well, which in turn will make us more competitive over the neck over the coming decades overseas as well. So I think you know, withdrawing from those agreements is actually giving up a lot of our leverage on that international landscape today. The president oftentimes, it seems to me anyway, behaves as if, you know, we're kind of Gulliver tied down by all the Lilliputians on the international stage, our allies, our partners, international agreements, and that, you know, the, the best way to realize our full potential in the world is to throw off 
all of those ties and all of those bonds. I think that's precisely the wrong way to look at what's going to be most effective in terms of promoting American influence on this fast-changing international landscape. Trump spoke of America first. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke of a new nationalism, a new approach, not dissimilar from some of the things we've seen with Brexit and mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, do you, are you somewhat troubled by all this? Yeah, I mean, I'm troubled in the sense that I think we can sometimes reinforce each other's worst instincts. You know, in a way, we're having a political nervous breakdown on both sides of the Atlantic right now. It's not as if there's anything intrinsically wrong with putting, pushing your country, your nation's interests above everything else. I mean, that obviously makes sense. But in my experience, American foreign policy has been at its most effective when we've applied a sense of enlightened self-interest. In other words, a sense that our own self-interest as a country, as an American society, is going to be most effectively promoted when we're making common cause with as many other players out there on the international landscape as share those interests as we can. And what I fear is that the Trump administration is turning that notion of enlightened self-interest on its head so that it's a lot more about the self part than the enlightened part. And I think this is a moment on the international landscape when we really need to look carefully at that. Yeah. What about the posturing that we've seen? Uh, fire and fury uh, going to attack uh, uh, 52 sites in Iran, uh, which probably would violate international law, including um, world monument sites. Uh, I mean, does that have any place in diplomacy? Yeah, I mean, posturing, you know, in any kind of human interaction, including diplomacy, sometimes has a place. But it needs to be connected to a thoughtful strategy, in my view, any of that kind of positioning that goes on. Because if people see it to be empty bluster, then what's going to happen is your allies are going to hedge because they start to lose faith in your willingness and ability to deliver. Your adversaries are going to take advantage, like the Chinese and the Russians are in some respects today. And the institutions that we work so hard over seven decades after the end of the Second War to World War to build, start to wobble. And so that's really what's at stake today. So you've cried to wolf uh, once too often. Yeah, and uh, uh, sooner or later that comes back to haunt you, I'm afraid. Do you also see uh, that uh, Trump has put us on a uh, course of action uh, toward uh, disruption, disruption of international arrangements? I guess we've talked about it, but yeah. Really, disruption in the world, where uh, well, you know, this could get us into a, 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 some kind of a, a military confrontation. It could. I mean, you know, disruption can be a useful thing to do um, in diplomacy sometimes when you need to rethink old assumptions, whether it's adapting alliances, as we were talking about before, or sometimes, you know, considering novel approaches to dealing with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, as an example. But when you have disruption for its own sake, when it becomes an object in itself, and you don't pay much attention to plan B or what happens with the results of your disruption, then I think you're asking for trouble. Now, Churchill said uh, America always seems to get it right after it's tried everything else. How would you see the way forward? How can we uh, repair the damage that's been done? Well, I think it's going to take a lot longer to fix than it's taken to break. And again, I would emphasize that the drift in some ways in American diplomacy predated the Trump administration. Um, so we shouldn't underestimate the challenge of rebuilding not just diplomacy, but our view of the world um, in a much different era than what I you know, learned when I came into the Foreign Service in the midst of the Cold War or in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War as well. So, you know, it's going to require also bridging, you know, a pretty fundamental disconnect in our own society, too, between people like me, you know, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of Americans who, when we preach the virtues of disciplined American leadership, don't really need to be persuaded of the importance of the United States engaging in the world, but they're skeptical about the discipline part because they've seen too many instances, whether it was the war in Iraq in 2003, the global financial crisis a few years later, in which American leadership has not been disciplined, in which we've not matched ends to means, in which we've let 
hubris get out ahead of our ability to actually get things done within the limits of our agency as well. So we have to be honest with ourselves, whomever's sitting in the White House, about the importance of bridging that disconnect with lots of American citizens and rebuilding a sense of trust in disciplined American leadership. Uh, has our prestige in the world, in your view, been undermined by uh, the president's apparent effort to use our foreign policy for domestic political advantage? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think the Ukraine crisis is um, a powerful example of that as well. It's what happens when essentially you have a White House that tries to use the instruments of American national interest to pursue personal political interests as well. And that's really what was at stake. And in the process to corrode the institutions that I think are so important um, for American citizens and promoting our interests overseas, whether it's the State Department or the U.S. military or the Justice Department or anybody else. So I have a question for you, Bill Burns. It's been just marvelous. And my question is, are you worried about the future of our diplomacy? I am. I am. First, it's been wonderful to be with you. And, and I am worried about that. As I said, I think there's, there's been a hollowing out of American diplomacy, of the State Department as an institution, which we first need to recognize and understand why it matters at this particular moment on the international landscape. Um, and then I think we need to rebuild a sense, a connection between people in Washington and people across our country about the significance of trying to rebuild that tool of American diplomacy. A connection. Bill Burns, thank you so Thanks, much Jim. for coming by. My pleasure. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.